Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, welcome to any new faces and also those returning again. It's great to have you all here. I'm Charlene from Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful and I'm the Environmental Education Manager, managing projects such as Eco Schools, Young Reporters for the Environment. Um, we're working in conjunction today with our Tackling Plastics Northern Ireland uh, project, which is funded by the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. So this is the sixth in a short series of Tackling Plastic webinars for Eco Schools Northern Ireland, which is run by Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful. So today I'm delighted to have Paul Moore with us. So Paul is a fantastic local wildlife expert and valuable member of our Eco Schools volunteers. So today he'll lead us on a journey exploring invertebrate life cycles and how pointless plastic can affect our pond life pals and how small changes can go a long way in protecting the quality of our waterways. So hopefully by the end of the webinar, um, you'll feel more empowered to take eco action to reduce your use of pointless plastic in the classroom and at home. So before I hand over to Paul, I'd like to introduce my colleague and co-host today, Claire. You're very welcome, everybody. My name's Claire. I am from the Tackling Plastics team at Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful. So I'll be moderating the chat today. A little bit of housekeeping before we hand over to Paul. At the very bottom of your screen, folks, you'll notice there is a participants button and a Q&A button. We're going to ask you throughout this webinar, please, to send us through your questions as and when you think of them. And make sure you put those into the Q&A button and we'll be able to make sure that Paul receives those towards the end. In the participants button, we can chat, we can communicate with you. So anything you want to know or if there's any links in the future, we'll pop those in there. But just for housekeeping sake, any questions, just ensure that you put them into the Q&A. So uh, you're very welcome all. And I'm going to hand over now to Paul Moore, who will take us through plastics and pond life. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking about plastics and pond life, mainly pond life, because we all know plastics is bad for you from, from day one. It's been around an awful long time. Unfortunately, it's going to be around an awful long, longer than we are, unfortunately. So plastic and pond life, can they coexist together? The answer is no, really. You need nice, clean water for aquatic insects and plants to survive. The, the slide on the, 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 the dirty looking slide there is fairly stagnant. The one on the right is an ideal, idealistic sort of view of pond life with nice creepy crawlies in the bottom and plant life flourishing quite nicely. But you add plastics, you get a lot of consequences, unfortunately. So I'm going to discuss the effects of, of plastic themselves in pond life, and then I'm going to give a good long talk about the, the invertebrates you actually get in the pond. So this pond here was actually built to house newts and frogs near a landfill site, which I visit quite regularly. The landfill site is a typical place full of plastic bags, rubbish, plastic bottles, but this site here has nets up to keep all the plastic within the landfill site, and the pond itself is ideal. It's full of dragonflies, damselflies, flies, water boatmen, pond skaters, leeches, uh, frogs, and newts as well. Not a plastic bag in sight. And that's the way ponds should be. Unfortunately, we're losing our ponds as people drain them and they get put into disuse or get overgrown. So later on, we're we'll talking about how we can actually revitalize water sources for uh, invertebrates and newts and, and frogs. I intend to show some of the common insects and vertebrates that exist in normally unpolluted ponds. Okay, so that's ponds that are out in the wild, not touched by plastic. Rivers and streams have a more dy dynamic sort of flow and produce different plants and animals in a never changing environment. They get aerated all the time, the water's rushing past all the time, whereas ponds are a static water body and a very easy target for plastic pollution buildup. Okay, simple enough, ponds are easy targets. And we unfortunately uh, pollute them quite heavily. Whenever plastic packaging uh, actually pollutes pl ponds, there's a gradual change in the composition of the water as layers of the plastic build up. Oxygen normally dissolves into the water at the water surface, uh, into the water and is held there. Uh, there's also, and therefore, if there's a, a layer of plastic, carbon dioxide and other decomposition gases can't be released. And this causes changes in the uh, pH of the, the water, acid and alkali levels. And this has dramatic effects on the mini plankton and plant life initially, but eventually leads to severe consequences 
to higher life forms. So you start off with a mini plankton that affects the, the browsers, the, the aquatic uh, insect life that feeds on them. If there's no plankton, the, light, the, the food chain stops. So this affects both plants and animals from plankton all over the food chain. And if you go to a pond which is heavily polluted, there's always bad smells, but like bad eggs, hydrogen sulfide smells, and the water starts to turn cloudy as well. And this, this has dramatic effects on the water itself and the things that inhabit it. Quite often, plastic packaging, it contains food and there'll be food residues there, which can attract scavengers and uh, things like wood, uh, water wood lice, which you go in looking for, for free food. Uh, if they don't eat it, this food can degrade into a fungal or bacterial soup, which is natural upon. So we go get this nasty stuff. It's like having a, a bottle of milk going off in your fridge. Would you drink that stuff? No. So why should animals live in that sort of stuff too? How, how long do you think a goldfish could live in a plastic, a single plastic bag of water? The answer is about four hours. I haven't done this. I've been researched on this. A, 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 a goldfish will use up its oxygen in a plastic, plastic bag within about four hours. So uh, if the scavengers become trapped in the bags or bottles, they may die. And their bodies will then attract more scavengers and again, so eventually result in a, a lot of noxious soup of dead bodies. Okay. And plastics, because they're mainly uh, non-biodegradable, they act as an insulating cover over the surface of the water. This results in reduced sunlight levels affecting plant photosynthesis. So if there's not enough sunlight, plants can't uh, develop, develop starch, they can't produce oxygen, which goes back into the water as well. So there's a dramatic effect if you blank out the sunlight. There's also an insulation effect, and that causes an increase in water temperature, and even two or three degrees can make the water uninhabitable for the resident pond life, both plant and animal. So plastics, good or bad? Definitely bad, okay? The food chain here starts here. Plankton, this is the basis of the food, uh, food or pond food chain. If you think out in the oceans, you think of the giant whales, the, the big whales, sucking up thousands and thousands of gallons of water with all the plankton, and then they sieve it out and eat it. Here in the pond, plankton floats around the place quite happily, um, utilizing the sunlight. The, the phytoplankton are single-celled algae or plants that produce most of the food in the pond. So they're, they're a massive big amount of food in the pond itself. They help to form oxygen uh, through photosynthesis. If you didn't have them, you wouldn't have the zooplankton, which are animal-like organisms that prey on the phytoplankton. And again, they themselves are preyed on by filter-fitting insect larvae in So this is the basis, this is where the food chain starts. So you got a massive amount of these things. You wouldn't see them normally, because they're being eaten all the time by other creatures. And this just shows you the variety of the plankton in the water. Now to see these, you need a high powered microscope. Um, a compound microscope would do this proud. If you got a drop of water from a normal pond and put on a high powered microscope about uh, 100 or 200 times magnification, you'll see these beautiful shapes and colors. Um, this shows the sort of variety of life in the pond itself. You don't see it because it's microscopic. Spiral jar strands, this is stuff that's like a filamentous stuff, um, which you'll see if the water gets um, out of control, not through pollution, but just because there's good sunlight and lots of oxygen, these things get out of control and cause a, a sort of a bloom of green on the surface itself. So these are still good. They're still producing oxygen. They're making oxygen go into the water itself, but they can't get out of control, unfortunately. Well, that's about uh, a thousand magnification. Beautiful strands, spiral sort of strands of the uh, chlorophyll cells within the spiral jar. And here's actually one of the small zooplankton, the animal rotifer, which is grazing on the plant plankton. plankton. So you can just see it there. Um, that's the rotifer there. And it's chewing away. You can see one of the, the phytoplankton being swallowed there. It's just food for everything, really. So we can't do without the plankton. Here's diatoms. 
there's a magnification there, 200 magnification. If you've got microscopes in school, uh, suggest the teacher would go out to the pond, if you've got a pond, and take samples of the water and just see what's out there. But you will need high magnification. Just as you show some of the variety of the creatures you can see. And then these are the feeders, the zooplankton, animal-like creatures. Some are larvae of insects, very, very small. Some are uh, normal size. There's a, 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 a Daphnia there. They're cyclops. Um, they're like mini lobsters. That's almost like a mini lobster there. That's the larvae of an ocillus, um, one of the water wood lice. So that's sort of a range of things there that are in the water. Beat me there. Yep, okay. Uh, Daphnia, they do have babies. Uh, they're very, very content. Sometimes you get uh, the female, that's the, male, that's the female there. The, the adult will swallow the phytoplankton and you'll see all the green specks in her body as well where she's feeding away. But unfortunately, they'll eat anything that they think's food. And sometimes they do eat plastic, microplastics as well. Last week, Nick Baker was talking about microplastics and saw some lovely slides of Daphne, well, some, some horrific slides of Daphne actually half filled with plastic uh, micro pellets. So if they get filled up, they don't, they, they don't want to eat anymore and they just stop eating. The slide down below there, you can actually see uh, the green filled, chlor uh, chlorophyll filled uh, phytoplankton that these have fed on already. And there's a cyclops there, so called cyclops because there is one eye right in the very middle of its head. Only needs one eye. And these are actually gills that they use to absorb oxygen from the water. Okay. So that's the sort of thing. That is the baseline. That's the basics of the pond. If without them, you wouldn't have a pond life at all. So they are quite susceptible to pollution in the water. If you wipe them out, nothing else is going to live. So now we're going to talk about some examples of invertebrates that exist in ponds. Start with those that aren't very happy in polluted waters. Now I say polluted waters, I'm still saying plastic is polluted because people throw in a, even a plastic bag, a, a, a crisp bag even, will have residues in that. And there's salt in it and salt doesn't normally exist in ponds. So even a plastic bag will, will uh, count towards pollution in the water. So these are sort of things are very intolerant of pollution. And that's because these aquatic larval and nymphal stages use gills to absorb oxygen from water. And so they suffer very badly from pollution. The more pollution there is, the less oxygen diffusion in the water itself and more concentrated carbon dioxide in the water, which they're not happy with at all. So these, this group here, group one, very intolerant pollution, because stoneflies, mayflies, uh, diving beetles, Caddisfly larvae, um, the right handed snail, uh, and Dobson fly larvae. They, these aren't found everywhere. In fact, we don't have some of these in, our, in Ireland at all. But it gives an idea the stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies, and the diving riffle beetles are all found here in Ireland, and the right handed snail. So they need to absorb oxygen direct from the water. If there's no oxygen, they won't survive. There's some nice photographs. Mayfly, larvae, and adult. You can see there, there's the gills along the side of it, and that's absorbing moisture, uh, absorbing oxygen from the water itself directly. The larvae move around the silt, feeding on the tritus and some dead plants. They're not carnivores at all. They're simply grazers. Uh, and they can live for about two years, just footing around in the, in the, the silt and the, the pond. Whereas the adults, the famous mayfly, which anglers love, they, come only arrive, they, they hatch out from the pupal stage of the mayfly and only live for about 24 hours. They don't feed, they don't have mouth parts at all, they don't need to feed. All their feeding has been done as the larvae. So they spend two years, grow themselves up, feeding away, and then come out and live for one day. Seems like an awful waste, so it does. But the adults are food source for a whole range of birds, bats, and fish, frogs, newts. So they're not really wasted. They're only there for 24 hours, but they contribute uh, greatly to the, the pond life itself, to the higher creatures, unfortunately. 
a beautiful creature. If you look at the, the wings on, on the mayfly itself, almost like a lace wing, all those little veins all attached together. Um, and quite distinctively, the, the larvae has these three tails here and they carry through to the adult. They're not actually used in the adult, but they, they will use those as a sort of sensory organ. Okay. So two years for the adult for the larvae and only one day, 24 hours for the adult. Caddisflies, these are fantastic creatures. Um, you actually can tell which species it is by the coating it has. On this one here, this has coating of small bits of pebble to help it disguise itself. Because what would eat these would be things like dippers and other sea, uh, water birds. And that, that's a good source of protein. So, it is. so if they can hide away, if they can disguise or camouflage themselves with these little stones in the bottom of the pond, they will survive. A lot of them do get eaten by birds. Again, life goes around. It's a merry-go-round, fortunately. They survive, they, they get eaten and give life to dipper families, so they do. This one over here is actually getting bits of uh, vegetation and webbing it up. They actually use, they produce silk, a bit like a, a spider, and they, they, they spin this around their bodies and um, form this case outside. So these are case-bearing caddisfly. And they can live to, for about a year, year and a half underwater if they survive the dippers and the attacks from the rest of the birds. I have a specimen later on, I might get a chance to show you, of one that actually gathers snail shells to protect itself. And you can tell which cat's fly it is, which species it is, by whatever the case is covered with. Okay. So the larvae are herbivores fitting on water plants. Again, the adult there comes out. It'll last for maybe um, two or three weeks just. But again, it's a good uh, source of food for fish, uh, frogs, newts, uh, birds as well. And fishermen like to have this thing too. They call it the sedge fly. And they'll, they'll use those to figure out which artificial flies they need to use to catch the trout. Uh, sometimes a spoon, they take the contents of the trout to see what they've been feeding on and then alter their, their flies accordingly. Stone flies, adults and larvae. Again, uh, these are quite susceptible to oxygen uh, de deprivation. Deprivation? Deprivation? Well, if the oxygen, there's no oxygen in the water, these can't survive either. Again, lovely uh, wing venation on the adults there. The larvae are predaceous actually on other insects. The other insect larvae smaller than them. They're not going to tackle something big like a dragonfly larvae because that was their food. Water snails, they uh, are covered in mucus which continually absorbs uh, oxygen and diffuses out carbon dioxide. You'll see bubbles at the mouth of the, uh, the snail shell itself, and then that's actually carbon dioxide diffusing out. If they didn't get rid of that, it would float to the surface, unfortunately, and be easy prey for, for birds and things like that. But because they're surrounded by water all the time, it's an active diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. This one up here is actually a ram's horn snail, and I have a caddisfly larvae, which is covered with dead body of this here. I'll show you later. I've got a chance to see later on, but these are quite common uh, in the ponds. Now the second group, what's called moderately intolerant to pollution, so they can withstand it to a certain extent. You've got the bigger creatures like damselflies dragonflies, you've got these things called scuds or they're, they're like aquatic um, water, like uh, aquatic wood lice, get them on the, on the bottoms of the ground, at the bottom of the pond. Sow bugs, again, they're crustaceans rather than insects. You've even got crane fly there. The larvae of the crane fly are, are, are fully aquatic in the first stage and then they tend to crawl out and live around the edge of the ponds where they're easy picking for birds as well. Now you've got clams and mussels, They'll, they'll suck in uh, ox uh, water, take the oxygen out, oxygen out of it, and then spit out carbon dioxide water filled as well. Okay, 
So those are inside, those are invertebrates that are moderately intolerant of water. We'll see some slides of those. The dragonfly, one of my first, one of my earliest experiences was being bitten by a, a dragonfly larvae. The mouth parts are quite sharp and fierce. I tried to pick one up. It retaliated by biting my big, my, my finger and my thumb. Um, luckily it wasn't affected with anything, but they can bite quite quite a lot. They're, well, they're, they're defending themselves, so what do you expect? But they will feed on a whole range of insect larvae, tadpoles, uh, small fish, um, as the aquatic uh, larval form itself. Quite mobile around the place too. They'll, they'll swim, they'll, they'll, they'll jerk their bodies like they're swimming and also crawl if they have to. And once they're fully fed, they, they crawl up um, a water plant, anchor themselves to their front uh, legs, and then break uh, out through the back of the nymphal uh, body itself into this adult form here. It has to, the adult form has to climb up the branch or the piece of twig and then puff its wings out to produce these beautiful wing formations down here too. Uh, quite, they're quite inquisitive creatures too. I've actually held my hand out in front of them and they'll come on and sit on your hand and ask, you know, they'll look at you. They've got massive big eyes. You can see on the, on the, on the nymphal stages they've got big eyes. But they've got big eyes so they can see their prey a lot easier. There's the big eyes of the adult there too. But they'll sit and stare at you, try to work out what exactly you are that have landed on. But uh, they're they're very, very camera shy. If you hold one in your hand and try to photograph it with the other hand, they'll fly off as if they knew they're going to be photographed. And dragonfly family has the, 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 the lucky reputation of being around for two or three hundred or two or three hundred million years. And they were the biggest flying insect ever found in fossil form. Uh, it was around 26 inches wingspan. This was over two foot, 26 inches, yeah. What's that in real money? Uh, over half a meter in wingspan. So it was a massive big brute. Back in those days, the atmosphere was different, uh, different pressures, and they could actually sustain flight. That creature couldn't fly in our modern day now, unfortunately. Okay. But they are beautiful creatures, um, quite ferocious. The adults feed on flying insects. They'll grab insects mid-air, take them down and eat them. Unfortunately, they're not uh, immune from attack themselves. I came across eight uh, dragonfly wings on the ground one time. And what happened was a kestrel had flown, caught the dragonflies, took them to a, feed, a, a favorite feeding branch, eaten the whole dragonfly body and just dropped the wings. It had caught two dragonflies at the same time or one after the other and the wings were just left at the side. And I was able to pick them up and I still have them to show the kids. Uh, and back in Victorian times, uh, when Europeal found these wings, either had been eaten by trout or something like that and they spat the wings out or by hawks, they actually thought they were fairy wings. Now, if you look at the old Victorian books on the uh, illustrations of fairies, they're actually based on dragonfly wings. That was an interesting fact. Okay. Damselflies, smaller version of the dragonfly, really. Very, very pretty creature. Again, uh, they're very predatory as both the adults and the larvae. You can see on the larvae there, uh, the gills at the, back, at the bottom of there. So they do need oxygen as well to survive. They're very active creatures. The more active the creature, uh, the more oxygen it requires. And the, the adults will attack creatures in mid-flight as well, just like a dragonfly. Some of the crustaceans, crustaceans you'll find out there. The um, water slater, also called sow bug. It's just like a, a water version of wood lice. Uh, the common, common slaters you get under stones and rocks. It'll, it'll feed on detritus in the pond itself. It doesn't attack anything. It's simply um, uh, a grazer of anything that's breaking down. Anything decaying, it will eat. Unfortunately, this is the sort of thing that would be attracted to plastic bags with parts of remains of food in. And then if it's trapped in there, it'll die, start to break down, but doesn't break down completely. It'll spoil the, the, the water uh, content. Anything like gamers, 
These are like uh, freshwater shrimps, a bit more like the, the beach hoppers you'd find on shoreline under, under kelp or under seaweed. This is a freshwater version. They look like giant fleas. They hop along sideways as well. There's now, in fact, a terrestrial one of these has come to Northern Ireland in the last 10 years, and it's now in people's gardens. But again, they're both sources of food for other uh, aquatic invertebrates and newts and frogs as well. So it's all part of the food chain. Then we come on to group three, which are fairly tolerant of pollution. Not completely tolerant. These are things like midge larvae, planarians, which are not talk about too much. They're very, very small. You, you will get them, and they, they tend to feed on other, on other creatures like worms. Uh, black fly larvae, and then leeches. Everybody's friend, the leech. I love leeches, so do. Don't know why. I saw some pictures of those. Midge larvae. There's the gills down the bottom there. So we're a fan of gills. And that's, again, uh, there's oxygen, carbon dioxide diffusion through the gills themselves. So they can tolerate some pollution, but if it's too polluted, they will not survive because they're very, very active creatures too. And they're, they're active because they're using their mouth parts to run around or to swim around catching um, plankton in their filter mouth parts. So they go around scooping up, mouth, uh, scooping up plankton with their mouths. So they have to be quite active uh, to keep, keep themselves filled. But like the wheel, you know, the, they have to take in these thousands of gallons of water and then sieve out the plankton from it, the krill. So they're quite active, but they're, they're using buoyancy as well. They're going up in the water and catching all the, the krill and then going down again. These things don't have enough of a scope to actually catch, to look after the prey, chase the prey. But these will turn into midges eventually, sometimes non-biting, sometimes biting midges. Leeches. These will feed on tadpoles, small fish, insect larvae, and earthworms. They do not bite us, so don't worry about it. There is a medicinal leech, which is not common in ponds, and it is used to actually suck our, it will suck our blood, but they're, they're specially bred. Uh, horse leeches will stick to you, will, will, they have suckers at both ends. The mouth parts are at this end, and there's a sucker at the other end, very hard to get off. But they use the suckers to attach themselves to stones or branches or to uh, ground debris so they'll get washed away. But they will, their mouth parts are quite uh, good at sucking the insides of, of tadpoles and small fish. The, you, and small in, insects will actually be eaten whole. Unfortunately, there's a little worm called a Gordian worm, which uh, lays its eggs in the water. And if the leech swallows it, it will eat inside it and parasitize inside the whole leech and turn the leech from a nice green color to red. And eventually it bursts out through the side of the leech and it dies. And the, the worm will then lay more eggs, start the whole process, process over again. Leeches are fantastic swimmers. If you ever come across one and put it in an aquarium, it swims better, almost as good as uh, dolphins. They're beautiful swimmers. There. So that's one good thing you see outside with leeches. Okay, on to group four, things that are very tolerant to pollution. Now, why is that? They've got different strategies here. You've got aquatic worms like tubaflex, and then you've got blood worms, which are the midge larvae. And then you've got rat tailed maggots and snails again. The rat tailed maggot uses this long tail like thing, it's actually a siphon. And it sticks the end of this above the water. They can actually survive in slurry. We should see in a second here. There we go. There's the rat tailed maggot there. And this tail can go up to about two or three inches in length. I, I well, I, I didn't intentionally breed these. I had them in my water butt. And my wife was horrified when she saw all these things hiding below the water and their tails sticking up above the the, the surface of the water, and they're breathing air directly from the water, from the, the uh, it's above the surface of the water itself. And they're just uh, grazers. They'll feed in any uh, phytoplankton or zooplankton in the water itself. And they uh, they eventually turn into this creature here, the drone fly, which looks very like a, a drone bee, a male bee, uh, but it's only got one pair of wings, whereas bees have two pairs of wings. 
And again, I, I bred hundred, well, I say not intentionally, I allowed hundreds of these things to breed in my water butt. I was re rewarded by hundreds of these drone flies coming out over the summertime and hovering in front of my face. I held my hand out and we get one or two landing on my hand and just look at my face. They're beautiful things. And then they go off, they're great pollinators, so they go and visit all the flowers and pollinate the flowers too. But this, this rat-tailed maggot can't survive in a slurry pit. And a slurry pit is completely devoid of oxygen. So it's using its breathing tube to suck in oxygen directly from the air. Another strategy, another strategy is uh, hemoglobin. We have it in our blood and it is, it's used to store up oxygen, to take oxygen and store it up. So like the blood worms, these are the larvae of the non-biting midge. They will store oxygen in their hemoglobin and get through life quite happily like that. So if they get a good feed of oxygen, they can store it for a long time. Unfortunately, the non-biting midge looks very, very similar to mosquitoes. So people have a panic when they see loads of these things around the place. They're related to the Loch Ness fly, which we have in the millions, if not billions, around, around Loch Ness over the summertime. Completely harmless, great food for the migrating birds or swallows and house morns come up Loch Ness year after year after year, and they're feeding on the adult midges, whereas the fish and frogs love the larvae, really good, good feed for them. And that's just to show the egg mass of the uh, midge themselves. Okay, we'll go on to the, the nasties now. Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are dependent on water for their eggs, the larvae and the pupal stages. The other fly lays his egg on this, in a raft on the surface of the water itself. They hatch out into the larvae, but you can see here, there's a breathing tube directly onto the surface of the water. Back in the old, bad old days, uh, in certain countries, they used to spread oil over the surface of the water and that actually blanked out the breathing tube and that killed the larvae. Very, very effective, but it didn't do much good for the rest of the aquatic life in the water itself. So oil was used to, you know, mosquitoes do kill, still kill a million people a year throughout the world. Back in those days, there were 25 million people were dying from mosquitoes through malaria. So we've come a long way. We're still not there yet, but there's different ways of dealing with mosquitoes. If you have mosquitoes in your own pond, well, the most effective ways is to bring put fish into it, and fish will eat the, the larvae, the pupae, and the eggs too. They even take the old adult. So they're they're quite they're they're a lovely creature, lovely life cycle as well. But unfortunately, now this knack of spreading malaria and killing off humans. And we have malaria here in Ireland in all the Cromwell's time. In fact, he picked up malaria from an Irish mosquito. We have about 17 mosquito species in Ireland, three of which are still capable of carrying malaria if the disease was here. Uh, these things are called uh, chiggers or jumpers sometimes. They, they spin around the place, they're, they're very, very active. You can see there, I say, that was just the breathing tube of the larvae. The pupa don't stay as pupa very long, but their breathing tubes, they're actually coming back their head. So they have to stay near the surface to actually um, breathe while they're in the pupal stage. They don't need too much oxygen, but they can survive. And then once they're fully, fully grown, they become an adult. And there's what mosquitoes do best, suck our blood. Only the females suck our blood. The males uh, feed on nectar. So not all mosquitoes are bad. Some are males just eating nectar. But that is actually a fully engorged female mosquito. And that red tinge in her abdomen is blood, human blood. That wasn't me, luckily enough. Uh, we all react differently to mosquitoes as well, because um, it depends what the mosquitoes have been feeding on before. It could be a human, it could be a bird, it could be a frog even. Mosquitoes do attack frogs quite, quite ridiculously, but they, they have blood, so why not take it? So whatever the, the mosquitoes have been feeding on last, they regurgitate part of that meal into your skin, and that's what causes irritation. Okay. 
and that's how malaria is carried over to they regurgitate the blood from the last some of the blood from the last meal as that last person had malaria then that's pumped into your blood system and that's how you catch malaria now this looks like a mess of hair they're actually tubiflex worms aquatic worms full of hemoglobin again living down in pond sludge if vermeers keep aquaria at all tubiflex worms are the things that are used to feed your fish they're usually frozen but if you look inside uh, deep in pond sludge you'll find masses of these things as well utilizing the hemoglobin to store your oxygen again great fish food and frog food and newt food. I don't think too many insects actually feed on them. So usually they're, they're higher up amphibians. Some of the beautiful creatures as well, water boatmen. The, this one here uh, is the common water boatman, the, the upright one as it were. These are big paddle-like feet for swimming with here at the sides. And there are the wings. It has two pairs of wings Underneath this uh, protective wing casing here, there's a pair of functional wings, so they can actually fly, and they do fly at nighttime quite readily. But these are sort of paddle-shaped legs for helping it uh, paddle through the, the water itself. But they're plant feeders. Um, again, great food for other animals, unfortunately. Whereas these ones is a back swimmer, an up upside down water boatman. It's called a lesser boatman. And again, it's got these paddle shaped legs, but this, this swims upside down under the surface of the water. So wait for something to come up near it, something like a, a tadpole or even a small fish, and we'll attack it and kill it. So these things can kill. Even if you have goldfish in your pond and this thing flies into it and lands there, it can attack a goldfish or frogs in the pond itself. They'll, fail, they'll feed all the invertebrates as well. So it's a predatory one, whereas the last one is a plant feeder. This is a predatory one. Pond skaters. These are amazing creatures. They're so light and the ends of their legs have got a filamentous, um, filamentous hairs on them. And they don't even break the surface of the, of the water. So they can actually skate, walk along the water quite happily. And they're predators. There is one there. It's actually got its proboscis out sticking through the water, looking for something to feed on. It can feel vibrations of things in the water and head towards it. But they literally walk across the water as pond skaters. Uh, it's about seven or eight different species of those as well. And now we're talking really good uh, predators as well. The reason the water scorpion survive is this is this long breathing tube here. That's why I got the name as a, a water scorpion. It doesn't have a, a poisonous sting. It doesn't do us any harm at all. All the action is with its front legs. It grabs hold of its prey and then injects a saliva, which breaks down the contents of the body itself and then sucks it up. So it is quite a quite a big meaty animal. So it is. Um, it's it's a gorgeous thing, and they do fly as well, but they they can survive quite happily because they can breathe directly out of polluted water. As it gets too polluted, they'll fly off somewhere else. I have a specimen of a, America, a South American species, which is quite a big beastie, and hopefully we'll get some time to look at it later on. Great diving beetle, the larvae and the adults. They're both uh, voracious predators. It's the, the biggest beetle we get in Ireland. Probably the biggest beetle we'll get in the UK would be the stag beetle. Um, unfortunately, we don't get the stag beetle here, but the, the great diving beetle, again, they will nip you or me. Uh, they're not fussy with what they eat. Uh, they'll go for anything at all. They have drawn blood in me too, if I handle them live. Uh, the male is quite distinctive for this yellow band on his thorax. The female has these long stripes and they do fly. I've had people have them fly in through car windows and didn't know what they were. And, them for identification. But they'll eat small fish, tadpoles, other insects. Uh, if they get into your pond of, of goldfish, they'll wipe them out very, very quickly. And there you can see the mouth parts on the larvae, quite fierce, pierce, sharp, piercing mouth parts. 
and there's your little filamentous um, uh, appendage at the end there for taking in oxygen. They don't need very much toxin at all, so they're quite uh, quite tolerant to pollution. Water spiders. Two things here. You can see this one here is actually walking on the water. Again, it's got these filamentous uh, ends of the legs, so it can get through the surface tension doesn't break at all. This one here, you can just make out this bubble of air around its abdomen, and that actually takes the oxygen down. They can form nests, uh, webs underwater, and they're completely airtight, and they'll, they'll um, shake off this oxygen into the air bubble and form a bubble there, lay its eggs in there, and then go and catch food by crawling along the ground, the, the silt of the, the pond, and bring prey, prey back for its eggs. So these actually use um, more like a, a scuba diving kit. They have their, water, their, um, their air bubble attached to them. So that's the, full, that's the air bubble around the odd one there. It's, got, it's full of hairs and the hairs attached to the air and that's, that's just not released until they want to. They preen themselves and they preen the air in their air bubble. It's a bit like an escape chamber inside a, a submarine. So, uh, here's a question. How long is it going to be before caddis fly larvae have to use bits of plastic as disguise to blend in with surroundings? They will use almost anything they can to disguise themselves. Last week, Mick Baker showed one or two experimental ones where sands have put in bits of plastic to see if the caddis fly would make it stick to their bodies. And it did work, but only in small amounts. But it's not a matter of time. You look at the amount of plastic we're throwing into the ponds, or not deliberately, well, maybe we are doing it deliberately, because you're getting milk containers, cola bottles, crisp packets, sweet packets, uh, bits of silver, paper, and all the rest of it. And if they break down to small enough pieces, there's no reason why cats fly can make change, almost be robots. It's not something we want to see. I wouldn't like to see naturally occurring creatures using artificial um, pieces to protect themselves. You would like to see a hermit crab with um, a piece of plastic as a, as a shell. Okay, so let's keep nature as it is. What can we do to help these pond creatures? Well, first thing, of course, clear up my plastic contaminated ponds. If you're doing that, you don't take all the plastic away immediately, leave along the sides so the water can drain out of them and any creatures who are trapped in them can also escape back in the pond too. Uh, quite often we would have to take too much pond weed off ponds as well because it's uh, smaller than the, the water. And again, you take that off just to the side of the pond, then any invertebrates and snails and things go back in the water by themselves. Second thing is try to use natural alternative materials instead of plastic. I campaign against a very big drinks company who should use glass bottles instead of plastic bottles. At Christmas time, they bring out glass bottles quite happily at a bit of an increase in price probably. But glass is a much more uh, useful material. We can use it over and over again. My father was a milkman and we would use the same glass bottles maybe 50 times in his lifetime until I drop one, of course. You know. But glass can be recycled as well. Plastic can be recycled too into plastic and then eventually thrown away. But glass uh, is a far better alternative. Paper bags instead of plastic bags. A lot of the big companies now are turning to paper as well. They see the way ahead. They're trying to pamper to our tastes. So paper bags, they're, they're biodegradable. They're reusable as well. Back in the old days when I was a youngster, Glass and paper uh, containers were all the rage. Cotton. Uh, I'm wearing a cotton shirt. There's a cotton shirt here. It was breathable. Uh, polyester. I, I have, <laughs> it may sound weird, but I've gone through landfill sites and dug up uh, polyester. I've actually seen stuff from 30 years ago. Polyester still as good as it went into the landfill site. So polyesters, clothing uh, is going to last enough long time. It is a plastic material, of course, as well. Bamboo, you can buy bamboo shoes now, bamboo, bamboo sh uh, shirts. So 
there's no alternative to. Unfortunately, if you're using a bamboo, you're depriving a very well-known creature of its food source, the old panda. But they'll probably make more bamboo in China to, to facilitate us. Another thing you can do is create an environment in your own school or your own home garden, which is suitable for aquatic invertebrates and amphibians. This can be as small as a, a small plastic basin. Okay, it is plastic. It will last, but it is usable. Okay, it's not being biodegraded. I have a couple of water butts in my back garden, which again, insects use all the time. And so do birds and, you know, birds come down, have a nice bath in too. Or you could build your own pond. Uh, one, of the, one of the charities I work for used to go to schools and build ponds all the time, building different aquatic plants. And within three or four weeks, the, the school was reporting frogs were coming in to utilize the pond and birds of course using as well. And then you get things like great diving beetles or dragonflies flying in and utilizing, laying their eggs in. And so the whole life cycle starts over again. Of course, one of the important things is don't litter with plastic, with anything for that, for that matter, and encourage others not to litter, especially parents. Parents are probably the biggest litterers of all. I didn't say that. And don't you tell your parents I said that either. Uh, unfortunately, there, there seems to be a generation gap where adults were not told not to litter. It became the, the end thing, you know. And I still see kids littering quite blatantly out in the parks. Um, and for that reason, if you joined a beach or a park cleanup, you can see how big the problem is. I worked for another company. We used to go out and clean up an estate and we'd fill five or six big uh, plastic sacks full of rubbish before lunch. And we came back and you do the same thing again after lunch. We actually found a mattress had been dumped in the middle of the area we just cleaned up. So, uh, it's encouraging people, it's, it's trying to spread the word, don't rot, don't litter the place, okay? We've all got to live together. Now, this is one of the top predators in the pond, a grey heron. He doesn't really look, look too happy in the future. Does he know something we don't know? I took this uh, in a park pond very close to me, and there are no frogs there anymore. Um, there are still some leeches, which you'll eat too. But you've got, we've got your our best to help him along too. Okay, so I think that's me finished. Yep. Great, Paul, um, thank you. If you wanna stop sharing your screen, that'd be fantastic. And then we've got a few questions for you. Oh, my video is not on, that would help. Mm -hmm. um, Claire, do you want to kick us off with some of the questions, Paul? That was I will, Paul, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. I found out today that leeches are beautiful swimmers. Every day is a school day. And also only female mosquitoes suck blood. That's something that was new to me as well, too. So I prefer to have never heard of rat-tailed maggots before, but I'm sure you'll argue that they're fantastic and vital in the food chain as well but um no that's brilliant so i'm going to go into the question there's a few ones that were coming in firstly james just wanted to james age seven hi james james wanted to know you were speaking about it earlier on um do dragonfly do tadpoles eat dragonflies no it's the other way around <laughs> uh, tadpoles um i actually catch tadpoles using a piece of liver on a piece of string and they'll attack it. So they will, they will attack fish, but they won't tackle a dragonfly larvae, which is in the water. A dragonfly larvae will attack the tadpole and the adults will also eat tadpoles as well. So tadpoles are carnivorous, but they wouldn't have a chance against a, a, a dragonfly larvae. Okay, that's brilliant. Thanks, Paul. Um, I have one here from uh, Jimmy Arias. So he's actually an English teacher in the Dominican Republic. And plastics is a huge issue um, here in their island. And he was saying, have you any ideas about what he could do with some of his sixth graders to maybe affect change there or things that they could do? I know you've listed quite a few there on your, on your yeah. segment, what they could do maybe in school. Well, trying to create a suitable environment for uh, the creatures themselves. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it is a big problem and they're not going to attack on, them, on, them, on their own. It's up to the government really to do something because a lot of the ponds 
uh, you can tackle a pond yourself, but you need then to put a fence around or a net over it to stop other people intruding on that pond too. So it's trying to create an exclusion zone. You can create your own wee pond yourself in the school and then protect it. Uh, that pond that was from the landfill site, it's got massive big nets all around the landfill site to stop plastic bags blowing off the landfill site. If they didn't have that, that pond would be swamped with plastic bags very, very quickly. Yeah. So if he wanted, he could use artificial ponds like water butts or basins full of water to study the insects and uh, amphibians around the place. But I think he's on a an uphill struggle trying to beat the polluted uh, ponds that are there. Is that the main problem? He's got lots of pollution, plastic pollution in the ponds. Yeah, just a thing around the island in general, yeah. He's just sort of yeah. saying how can you motivate, I suppose, the children to get involved. But I think the idea what you suggested is in, in the school itself and on the grounds to get the ponds and even through the water box and doing things there, yeah. I think. Agree yeah. So it's to, to show the children what they can achieve without pollution, because those children are, you know, 10 years, 10 years from now, they're going to be the adults and they could have well, in fact, in the government, if they vote the government on, if you don't sort this out now, you know, we're going to vote you out. It hasn't happened here, mind you. It hasn't happened in the, you know, the, the civilised world, as it were. Uh, we're the worst players of all, unfortunately, because we use our plastic. Um, I won't say who's responsible for it, but, mm -hmm. you know, big companies, oil companies, say nothing. <laughs> right, there's a couple of cracking questions in from Brenda. Brenda, I'm going to start with Christopher's. Um, so three Brenda, Christopher asks, have you found a caddisfly larvae covered in microplastics? I know, Paul, there was a really interesting slide there you had. Yeah. So it's possible, but I guess Christopher's wondering, have you personally found a caddisfly that's covered in microplastics? No. Okay. No, I, I made that one up, okay? But mm -hmm. last week, Nick Baker showed a caddisfly and some scientists had put in the caddisfly and added small microbeads. And the caddisfly did incorporate it onto its own case. So it is possible. Um, but I haven't come across in nature yet, luckily enough. But I do have a caddisfly covering those snail shells. But they'll, they'll use anything. Well, they won't use anything. They're reluctant to use plastic probably because it could float as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the one good thing about plastic, well, would birds eat plastic? I suppose it would be repelled to, to birds as well. So, But I haven't come across it yet. But dear knows what will happen in the future. Yeah, we've also got some images as well. We've, we've seen evidence personally with birds nest. I'm sure most people um, mm -hmm. are kind of tangent a little bit, but we've seen evidence in our home with birds eating plastic. So I suppose following through the food chain, they'll end up in bird stomachs as well. So yeah. I hope that answered your question, Christopher. Um, Charlene, any other ones that you can see there? Yeah, I can see another one there from Brenda. So um, she said that most pond liners are made from plastic. So does yeah. this have an effect? And is there a preferred type of pond liner or an alternative that um, she could use? They are meant to last. That's why you buy them. But they're underwater. They don't biodegrade. Uh, if they did biodegrade, they'd be useless. So they're there for life. Uh, instead of plastic, you can use the old-fashioned clay method where you dig a pit fill the clay and then get your shoes and socks off in and put a lot of water in and actually form a clay mold and it's completely impervious to water. So you could do that instead. But the plastic liners, that the one I showed did have a plastic liner too, a blue plastic liner, but it's soon filled with aquatic plants and the insects love it as well. The only thing is, is it's always bright blue and birds can see these creatures quite easily as well. So that's a, that's a negative effect. But it, it is buried. It's not going to buy a degree in anything else. So it will stay as a plastic liner for 30, 40 years. I think the guarantee is probably 20 years before it can get broken down. But it is a very good source of a liner for a pond. We, we, we don't like using it, but there's nothing else available unless you go for a clay filled one, which we've done a few times with some success. But that dries out, then the, the the clay cracks and then they lots of, lots of water out. But the plastic liners is good. Same with plastic basins, old plastic basins. Instead of throwing them out, let bury them in the ground to ground level. Now let them fill the water with rainwater, and the creature will start to utilise them quite quickly. All right, that's pretty good. 
wonder if we could get schools to do that. I like that idea, you know, on a smaller scale. It sounds fantastic. But you can actually link, you know, have three or four basins in a row and the creature will actually hop from one to another and you'll see birds coming quite quickly. And instead of having a, a, a bird bath, they use the basins and there's creatures on them which will actually hop into the water too and produce food for other invertebrates as well. Fantastic. Are there any more questions, Claire? Or? Yes. Um, hi, Sean. I've got a question from Sean Campbell. He's six. So, Paul, this is going to be your most difficult question yet. What yeah. is your favourite insect? That's a tough one. I must say I have a fondness for stick insects. <laughs> I go out to talks quite often with children and half of them are afraid of insects and half of them love insects. I bring out six stick insects in a little box and they've all got, they've all got names, Ricky, Mickey, Sticky, Dicky and Albert. <laughs> Albert's a bit strange, so he is. And I hand these out to the children and some who are afraid to want them. So I give them a stick, a real stick. I say, look, that one's not very well. Blow on it and maybe it'll start to move around. And nothing happens because it's a stick. So we're replaced with a proper stick insect. They blow on it and all of a sudden the legs spread out like a wee bat, like a battery armored creature and starts to walk, walk around like a, like a robot. And the kids love it. And they're past these stick insects around the place. They, they are so unlike insects. Kids really love them. So that's the sort of a crossover between people who hate insects and love insects. So the stick insect is probably a nice, a nice crossover. So it is. I love spiders too. Unfortunately, I know a lot of people don't like spiders, but you, we can't live without spiders, especially this time of year when it's getting near Halloween. Nice big scary spiders. There's one in the back of your kitchen there, in that room there in the corner. <laughs> That's me, Paul. Uh, Shirley, there's another question through there from Aidan Campbell, if you want to read. Aidan, I'm assuming you're the brother. Um, Aiden, yet, but I can't see the question, Claire. I don't know why. Can you read it? Under Terry Campbell, underneath. I can scroll down, can I? Yes. No, it's not letting me view it. Apologies, Claire. Um, Aiden asks, this is the one that I find really interesting too as well. Why do female um, mosquitoes suck blood but not males? Right. They have to have blood to form eggs. They need the protein to form eggs. Uh, the males don't produce eggs. All they do is mate with the female and then get eaten by fish. Whereas a female must have protein to form the eggs. If she didn't uh, feed on blood, she wouldn't produce eggs then. So that's all it is. It's a protein requirement to produce eggs for all blood, blood sucking insects. Same with bed bugs as well. Only the females, no, I got that wrong. Both males and female bed bugs eat, suck blood. Uh, midges, only female midges suck blood too. Okay, that's just yeah. for the introduction. We have time for one more. I think there's one there about how do you compare ponds? So Brendan asked, how do you compare ponds to bog gardens with regards like health and safety concerns at schools? I think schools are very much um, pushing bog gardens over ponds. What yeah, do you bog what do you gardens don't have much clear water as such. Um, I know there's an issue. We, we put a lot of ponds in and then they were filled in because there were more than three inches in depth in case somebody tripped and fell into it and drowned. There is a health and safety aspect to it, but if the ponds are in a locked enclosure, then only people who go in under supervision with teachers have access to it. If somebody breaks into the place, they're trespassing and they fall and drown, what comeback is there? Uh, I know it's a life lost, but you know you do so much. People drown in the sea every year, and that's not a health and safety issue. You know, people, yeah. A lot, yeah, you know, so a pond compared to the sea, uh, it's because of liability or nothing else. But the pond, the, the bog ponds do not have enough clear water for a lot of invertebrates to survive. Now, is this yeah. P Petey Bog one or Petey Bog? I'm not entirely sure. She just mentioned about a bog. So, a bog. Yeah. Um, but no, that's a great answer. And you're right, the seas are there all year round and there's no necessarily health and safety. No water, yeah. Um, but the, the, the small basins, you know, a small basin's made 12 inches across. You know, could you drown? I know you could drown it if you fell head for, first into it, but you'd have to be very, very um, committed to drown yourself in a, in a basin. Fair point. Where pond, ponds are bigger usually, about six foot across and three inches deep. Yeah. yeah. Well, Paul, um, 
we're going to have to, I suppose, end it there. I've actually ran over a wee bit, but it was great. It was so interesting. So um, I want to thank everybody for attending and asking all their interesting questions. And Paul, thank you so much for your invaluable contribution. Uh, and just a few quick um, reminders, I suppose, to everyone. So just to remind them all to add their plastic promise if they haven't already done so. And don't be panicking any of your friends or your colleagues, any peers, anybody missed um, this webinar because it will be getting up on our EcoSchools NI YouTube for everyone to view and share. It'll take a few days for that to happen, but it will be there. And you'll also receive a follow-up attendance email with a link to download your international certificate of attendance. And please check out our websites and social media for future webinars. And don't forget to like some of our pages. So that's us. And um, again, thanks very much. Take care, everybody. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.